want you to imagine that right over there is Jesus. And I know in the room and online, there may be lots of different ideas about who Jesus is, but just indulge me for a moment. Believe for a moment that he is who he says he is. He is God in the flesh, and, he, and he's right over there. And imagine you, you want to get to know him more. You're interested in like, I wonder what it would be like to learn from him, to, to follow him. And so you go up behind him, and you tap him on the shoulder. And Jesus turns to you, and he says, what? What does he say? The Jesus that you imagine in your mind, the Jesus that you know, what does that Jesus say to you? The first words that that Jesus says to you. Imagine you, you know very little about him. You've never met him before. You approach him. What does he turn to you and say, what is the tone that he says it in? What's, what's the tone of Jesus sound like? What, what does it sound like? What, what is it? What does he say? What is he interested in about you? What does he want from you or for you? What is it going to mean for you to be his student, for you to follow him? What is it going to mean for you to be his disciple? Good morning, everybody. We're beginning today a new series called You Are What You Love, and it's going to be a seven-week series, and the way that I want to set it up for you today is that it is a series about discipleship which means to follow Jesus. And what I'm hoping happens for you today and throughout this series is that perhaps how you view discipleship and what it means to be a follower of Jesus might get tweaked a little bit, tweaked hopefully in a good way. Now, I want to be uh, transparent with you that this title comes from a book called You Are What You Love by a Canadian James K.A. Smith. It's an amazing book. I think we're going to get it in the Resource Center. If you're interested in reading it, at least go on Amazon and read like the part that they give you for free. Worth its weight in gold. But this book is, is a book about reframing how we see discipleship. And why we need this, why I think we need this, why I think we all need this, either a reminder or a shift, is because there is a gap. There is a gap between what Jesus looked like and what the people who follow him look like. A little bit. There is a gap between the stuff that you know you should do and the stuff that you actually do. There is a gap between the way that sometimes you feel on a Sunday morning after you hear a great sermon and you're like, I'm going to change my life. This is everything starts to, this is day one of the rest of my new life. And there's a gap between that feeling and about Monday by 10 a.m. There is a gap between how we talk about new life, being reborn, transformation in Christ, and how we actually live our everyday lives. And this gap, Smith would argue, is created by this. He calls it the brain on a stick. And when I typed brain on a stick into Google, I got brain on a USB stick, which works the same way. But it's an idea brought to us by mo 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 modernity. <laughs> Apparently, I don't like that word. Modernity, which is that what we need is just to fill our brains with information. Because essentially, that's all you are, is like a brain on a stick or a USB stick. If you could just take your brain and plug it into the right information, if you could just hear the right sermon, if you could just go to the right Bible study, your life would change. What you're lacking is information. And if we could just get you the information, everything would change. This has been proven 
to be not true. If you have children, you know that this is not true. You give them all the information they need, and are they, do they behave? No. You know so many things you're supposed to do, and you still don't do them. Information is not what produces transformation. Not information alone, at least. And so don't hear me say that learning isn't important, that being a learner isn't important, that information isn't important, that theology isn't important. All of these things are important, but they are not enough. And so what we need is not less knowledge, learning, information. We need something more than just this. And so here's what we need to do, and what I'm hoping that we begin this morning, is that we need to change the way we think about discipleship if we want to see deeper transformation. If this is something that you want to see in the church, if you want to experience it in your own life, then we need to, we're going to need to change how we think about discipleship if we've been primi primarily thinking of discipleship as a brain on a stick. What we need, people aren't behaving well enough, we need more Bible study, we need more classes. Pastor, we got to go deeper. You know how many times I hear that? And what people mean isn't we need more transformation, it's usually, I want to learn more Greek and Hebrew. I'm like, that's great. I love Greek and Hebrew too. But that's not what produces transformation. We need something more. And so I go back to that image that I painted before, that Jesus is right over there. And Jesus turns to you. And perhaps if you have the brain on a stick image in your mind, then Jesus turns to you and he says something like, recite for me the books of the Torah. Do you know all 600 and something laws that are in the Torah? Tell me information. Or perhaps he turns to you and says, are you ready to work hard? Following me is gonna be super hard. You ready to work hard? Perhaps you have an image like that of Jesus. And yet we get this little scenario played out in the Gospel of John. And what John gives us is something beautiful, and it's the place where we're going to park this morning. He paints this narrative, this, this picture, that there are these disciples of a man named John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is the forerunner to Jesus. He's preparing people to get ready to follow Jesus. And one day John the Baptist says, there, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And these disciples hear it, and they do nothing. The next day, the same thing happens again. Jesus walks by. There he is, the Lamb of God. And this time, the disciples decide, let's go check him out. Let's go see what he's all about. And so they walk up behind Jesus. And Jesus somehow, you know, we don't get all the details, but it says that they come up behind Jesus, and Jesus, Jesus turns because he notices people are following him. Like, imagine that, right? They're just like, we're going to follow. We're followers of Jesus. Literally, we're just following him around. He doesn't know. And he turns to them, and this is what he says. What do you want? What is it that you desire? What is it that you love? Apparently, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, the first thing that he's interested in is getting at what's in your heart. What do you want? What do you desire? What do you actually love? Who actually are you? And the way that I'm going to learn who you actually are is by figuring out what is it that you love. Not only are these the first words of Jesus in this narrative? But John chooses, of all of the content that he would have had at his disposal, to make these the first words of Jesus in his gospel, which is, I think, his way of artistically and craftfully writing his book to say that, like, if you're a new follower of Jesus, this is where you begin. And perhaps you never really leave here and asking this question what is it that I love? What is it that I'm all about? What, what is consuming my 
my heart and my, my desires. Jesus asks this question, and John frames his gospel with this question. Because ultimately, you are what you love. You aren't just what you think. You aren't just what you do. You are what you love. Let me show you a couple other examples in Scripture where we get this same idea. In the Proverbs, in a wisdom book, we get this little line, above all else, guard your heart, guard what you love, guard what you are desiring, for everything that you do flows from it. Guard your heart, because your whole life flows from that place. Jesus, seemingly picking up on this wisdom tradition, teaches a similar thing in the book of Luke. Jesus says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Heart For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Paul, writing to the church in in Colossae, writes this. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Above everything else that you're aiming at, make sure that love is there. It's the most important one. It binds all these things together. And then this little line to his letter to the church in Philippi. This is my prayer for you that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Smith makes the point in his book, and and I had the same thing happen to me, that when I first read this, I thought, oh yeah, this is about abounding in knowledge. It's about, it's about, no, like, it is important what we think, and what, but that's not the ordering that Paul gives us here. That your love may abound more and more, and that from that comes knowledge and depth of insight. The ordering is that your love is being properly ordered and abounding, and from that comes knowledge and depth of insight. You are what you love. And so I talked earlier about changing how we, how we view discipleship. And so here's, here's one way that I think that we could define it. That discipleship is the transformation of what we love. Discipleship is is the transfer. I'm just going to give you a second just to sit with that if you haven't. Discipleship is not, I did all of these Bible study classes. Those could be good things if they lead to the transformation of what you love. But if they just lead to, now I'm super smart in Bible-y things, then who cares? Discipleship is the transformation of what we love. Now, if you're, a, if you're like ahead of me, you're going to ask the question, well, how does that? So then, great. How do we transform what we love? How? How is going to be the next six weeks of this series? But I'll give you the, the Coles notes. The how has to do with our habits, our rhythms, our everyday routines, and what Smith will call liturgies. It is the rhythms of our life that are shaping what we love. And so let me put it in Smith's words in the book. He'll, he'll change this and, and say it this way, that discipleship is the rehabituation of what we love. Because the world forms us to love in a certain way. We are all a part of rhythms that are teaching us, that are shaping our hearts. And so when we begin to follow Jesus, what he's going to do is invite us into new habits that will transform what we love. I thought, for those who rehabituation is like, it's too early for big word, rehabituation. Just let me say it even more simply then. Discipleship is learning to love. If you're taking notes, it's the only note you need this morning. Discipleship is learning to love. And when you put this view on of what it means to follow Jesus, that when you come up behind him and he turns to you, what he is interested in is, is I am going to reshape how you see the world and what you love. There is a huge bonus that comes with this. And the bonus is this, that oftentimes discipleship is taught as, or we pick it up this way, that it is a heavy burden following Jesus. He said, pick up your cross and deny yourself. Deny myself and pick up. Oh my goodness. Following Jesus. Following Jesus is a drudgery. Just a, oh, following Jesus. This is what it looks like. Get behind me, everybody. I'm doing it. This is, I'm amazed. And we think that that's the best version of discipleship. 
that the harder that it is, the better you're doing. The more painful that it is, the better you're doing. As if our desires are purely to be like squelched. As if God placed in us desires and a heart that is prone to desire and what he ultimately wants us to do is, yeah, just get rid of that. But with this view of discipleship, the bonus that we get is that discipleship isn't just about denying our desires. It's about the transformation of our desires so that we would want what God wants for us. And so discipleship becomes effortless. I want to read for you a few quotes that get at this idea from a book uh, by another Canadian named uh, Jen Pollock Michelle. And her book is called Teach Us to Want. And I just want to read you a few quotes that get at the idea that I just, that I just talked about. She says this, We aren't necessarily doing best when striving most. In fact, when it becomes more and more effortless to do all the difficult things God requires of us, this may be the truest measure of our spiritual transformation. How many of you would have said yes to this first sentence? I'm doing best when I'm striving most. When it's the hardest and yet I do it anyways, that's when I'm doing best. Now, not to say that we shouldn't do that. When you know what's right to do and it's painful, you do it anyways. That's part of it. But the ultimate goal of discipleship is to experience a transformation where it becomes effortless. Another quote. Look for increasing effortlessness for desires to be transformed, being formed into Christ. As you follow Jesus, what you should be looking for is increasing effortlessness. Imagine if that was the picture that we gave to people about what it means to follow Jesus. Not, oh, oh pick up my cross. And, but no, 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 it may feel like that sometimes. But ultimately, the goal is increasing effortlessness. One last line from her, she says this, coming easier to our obedience means coming into holiness. God's desire to make us like him, holy like him. Coming easier to our obedience means coming. The holier you get, the easier it will be to be obedient. And so pick up your cross, deny yourself, ultimately can become a, yeah, I can do that. I can deny myself because I love something more than myself. I can deny myself because I love something, someone more than myself. If you've ever loved another human being, you know what this feels like. If you have a spouse, if you have children, if you're an aunt or an uncle, if you, if you have someone that you love, you can, you can get this idea. Yeah, oh, it, you wouldn't say like, oh, it's such a pain. I have to deny myself to love my children. No. I do deny myself to love my children, but it's not hard. It's effortless. It just, it just comes out of me because I love them more than I love myself. It's God's vision for his church. I think about all the people that make church happen on a Sunday, all the people that make this room happen, that make Kitchener happen, that make Chatham happen, that make West Side happen, the people in Chatham taking stuff off trucks this morning, and they gotta, they gotta pack, they gotta unload everything, all the screens and everything. And that's what this place used to be like. And we still have to do the chairs, and there's coffee to be made, and there's people in the kids' ministry. There's so many things happening on a Sunday morning. Why does that happen? Because people get up in the morning and go, here we go. We gotta make the church happen. We gotta, we gotta make it happen, guys. Pick up your cross. Let's do it. Deny ourselves. Hopefully not. That church ain't gonna last very long. Hopefully it comes from a place of I can deny, I can deny my, I can give away my Sunday morning because, because I love the church, because I love Jesus far more than whatever I was going to do with my Sunday morning. There may be mornings where it feels a little difficult, but that's not the goal. The goal is to get to the place where I love the church so much more. And so it becomes effortless. God wants us to want. God wants us to want. 
The problem is, is that we have all these distorted wants that mess us up. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't want us to want. He just wants to transform what we want so that we would want what he wants and so we could follow him. Think about any relationship that you're in. I primarily go to my, my, my marriage to my wife, but you can think about any relationship, relationship with your parents, relationship with your kids, relationship with friends, coworkers. Where does breakdown in relationship come? It comes when two people want two different things. When do you fight with your wife? When she wants to spend money on this and you don't want to spend any money or you want to spend money on this. Two different wants. Where does your breakdown in relationship with God happen? When you want something that is different than what he wants for you. And just in case you didn't know this, God's not going to change what he wants. So if you want a relationship with him, you're going to have to let him change what you want. And the good news is that what he wants for you is far better than what you could ever want for yourself. This will take effort. Not work in the sense that we have to earn our way, but it takes some intentionality. It takes some awareness. It takes some effort on our part to experience this transformation in our lives. Because if you look at your life, if you, if you let Jesus ask that question, what is it that you really want? You realize, Jesus, I want a whole bunch of stuff that I don't think you want for me. I don't even think that it's good for me, but I still want it anyways. There's a, a movie that Smith talks about in his book, and it's called Stalker. And I've never seen the movie. I've never... I've never heard about it outside of this book. So if there's anything in the movie that is, like, not good to be watching, I'm not saying watch the movie. I'm just saying the ideas from this. I've learned this lesson, okay? I've referenced things, and I get in trouble. I'm like, I didn't even see it, okay? So this movie called Stalker is about three characters. And there is, there is a zone somewhere that they have heard of. And in this zone is a room. And in the room is an ominous kind of door. And if you go into this room, you will be given your heart's desire. And so the movie is about these three characters on their way to the zone to get to the room. And at the end of the movie, they get there. And they stand outside of the place where they could be given their heart's desire. All of their deepest wishes and desires could come true if they simply step into this space. And yet, you know what happens in the movie? Is that nobody goes in. Nobody wants to find out what's in this room. Why? Because as they stand on the outside, they begin to realize, what if, what if I don't love what I think I love? What if the things that I actually love aren't, aren't what I th really think I love? And so what if what's inside that room doesn't bring me ultimate joy, satisfaction, peace, happiness? What if what's inside this room actually destroys me? And so none of them face what's inside of this room. As Christians, or as people who want to become followers of Jesus, we have to face what's inside this room. And yet, and Smith writes this, or I think I heard him say it in this beautiful way. He says that encountering Jesus is like going inside of this room and finding out horrible things about yourself. Horrible things about what you actually want, what you actually desire, what you actually love. You go into this room and it's like you find out, oh my God. What I actually want is all of these horrible things. And yet encountering Jesus is like this, that within that room, someone steps from the shadows 
and says, I can change you. I can make all of these things not true. My invitation to you this week is to spend 10 minutes a day in this room with Jesus and let him ask you, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? Could you do that for 10 minutes a day? 10 minutes a day, sit with Jesus quietly. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal says this, all of humanity's problems and troubles stem from this, our inability to sit quietly in a room with our thoughts. We live in a world full of disguises and distractions that would like to disguise. You don't really love that. It's fine. It's all good. Distractions. Don't worry. You should be distracted all the time. And we never sit in a room quietly and ask, where am I headed? What do I actually love? What do I actually want? I invite you this week to sit quietly with Jesus for 10 minutes a day and let him ask you this question. Why am I fighting? I'm fighting with my wife. Why are we fighting? What, what is it that you want? I'm so unhappy with my job. I, I wish I could make more money. I don't like the people that I work with. I don't like the assignment that I was just given. What is it that you want? What, what is troubling you? What is it that you would like to have happen? God, my enemy has done this to me. I would, why don't you just destroy? I wish the worst things would happen to them. Is that, is that really what you want? Let's talk about that. I, I, think, I think discipleship, with when the earliest Christians, the earliest followers of Jesus, would have experienced this question every day. And it's why John places it at the beginning of his gospel. Imagine that the first thing Jesus ever says to you is, what is it that you want? And then every day after it, that's like the thing that you do together before bed. Like before everyone went to their tents and went, went to bed, that Jesus gathered all the guys around and all the ladies around and whoever was following, and he said, all right, guys, today you heard me teach about loving your enemy. What did you think about that? Did you want a world where that is true? And then they would have had to sit and be like, I don't want that. I don't want that at all. And then Jesus would be like, good night. We'll pick this up tomorrow. You heard me talk about loving money and how you can't love money and love me. What, what did you think about that? I didn't like that one either, Jesus. Boy, it seems like it's day after day of teachings that I do not like and that I do not want. And yet, strangely, I am still drawn to you. I still want you. And so I keep following. What is it that you want? Can you sit with him for 10 minutes a day and let him ask you that question? And here is some hope for you. That in the Gospel of John, when Jesus turns to those early disciples and asks them, what do you want? Do you know what they say? They say, as if they don't really know the right answer, they're like, uh, where are you staying? And then Jesus says, come and see. They don't have a perfect answer. They don't say, we want you and your kingdom. We're all about it. We're fully ready to go. They're just like, uh, we just, I think we want to just hang around you and learn from you. Is that okay? And Jesus says, that's, that's great. I can work with that. Come and see. And so as you sit in this room this week and you discover the dark places within your heart, realize that Jesus is not looking for perfection. He's just looking for a little bit of faith. And so I pray for us all, Jesus, would you show us what we love? Jesus, give us the courage to sit in this room with you. And Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us what we really want, what we really love, what we really desire. Jesus, we want to be people who are being transformed 
people whose love is being transformed so that we could bring your love more and more into the world. Help us to do this. Help us to be these people. In your strong name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.